let's get started. And uh, welcome to today, today's um, uh, technical uh, sessions on uh, earthquake early warning. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, the first session this morning is about uh, earthquake early warning around the globe. Some of the uh, a description of some of the systems that have been developed or are under development. And uh, so the first uh, talk this morning um, is uh, on this side. Yes. It's uh, the earthquake early warning of the Japan Meteorological Agency by Nakamura, Kotera, Tamarabuchi, Yamada, Adachi, Morimoto, and Hoshiba. And uh, we're all very excited to, to see the progress that's been happening in Japan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nakamura from Japan Meteorological Agency. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to make a presentation in this meeting. <coughs> Today, I'm going to review James EW system. Then, I'll show the performance of the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and some important lessons learned from the experience. I call the event the 2011 M9 event. Moreover, I'll describe about those for the aftershocks. Finally, I'd like to talk about future plan to improve the system. JMA began to operate the EEW nationwide in October 2007. It was seven years ago. We predict seismic intensities and arrival times of S waves after determining the hypocenter parameters. Then, we estimate magnitude by maximum displacement amplitude of ongoing waveforms. The group of the rupture is monitored using the amplitude in real-time manner. Main part of the EW uses only 220 JMA seismometers. Anyway, hypocenter de determination is at the important position. This shows JML seismic intensity scale, which has 10 degrees from zero to seven. The intensities five and six are divided into lower and upper part. Moreover, we use the instrumental seismic intensity by acceleration seismograms. That means our method is automatic one and our seismic intensity is not measured by feeling of human or structural damage. We calculate the seismic intensity using 60 second waveforms and 400 inverse Fourier transforms. We use about uh, 4,300 uh, 4, seismic intensity meters. This roughly compares between uh, JMA scale and USGS modified Mercury scale, usual modi uh, modified Mercury scale and MSK scale. There are two types of JMAEW. First one is uh, forecast for the registered users, and the other one is warning for the general public. We issued forecast in case where the estimated maximum seismic intensity exceeds two, or uh, estimated magnitude is larger than 3.5. In the case where the estimated maximum seismic intensity is larger than four, we provide the warning to the area where estimated seismic intensity is four or larger. And broadcast it through TB, radio, and messaging system using cell phones to the uh, general public. The difference of the grade, forecast, and warning is determined the, uh, by estimated maxim maximum seismic intensity, not magnitude. And the boundary is here. The boundary is here and between intensity four and five lower. The forecast is updated whenever it is necessary, but we provide the updated warning only when the estimated seismic intensity became larger than four, from uh, less than four in one or uh, more areas, and limit it within 60 seconds from the first detection.
Now I show the earthquake uh, example of the uh, case of 2011 M9 event. We provided the warning to the pink areas for the uh, general public and to the yellow areas only for the uh, registered users. Reverse triangles uh, shows uh, observed seismic intensity by the, uh, those colors. The earthquake early warning was disseminated 30 seconds after the earthquake occurrence within uh, was eight seconds. And uh, at the time, the estimate magnitude was 7.2. And the warning was, sorry, the warning was issued only for Tohoku district in which the seismic intensity was estimated greater than three. Solid line shows the wave front of the S wave, so that we could provide the warning before the arrival of S wave for all areas. When we issued warning, seismic intensity was less than three everywhere. Finally, we estimated the magnitude 8.1, but the actual magnitude was 9.0. Therefore, we underestimate intensities. Observe the seismic intensity was a uh, light one. For example, we exact, uh, expected intensity four in Tokyo Metropolis, but actually we observed the intensity five upper. The extent of the source region also caused the underestimation of uh, seismic intensities. So this is one main problem. The EW also has some problems after the Tohoku earthquake. Large number of aftershocks occurred after the 2011 M9 event. The red one is for the Tohoku earthquake. The blue one for the Sumatra earthquake and the green one uh, for Maori earthquake Chile. Even outside the aftershock region of the 2011 M9 event, the seismic, uh, seismicity became more active than before the event. I define the region A. Red circle shows uh, quakes after the 2011 M9 event. And those are one year span and one month span. Therefore, earthquakes sometimes occurred sim simultaneously over the wide region. Then the system became confused and didn't always determine the hypocenter parameters correctly. In 51 days after the main shock, 71 EWs were issued to the public, but in 21 cases, actual observed intensity didn't exceed two at any stations. That means there are a lot of false alarms. And mm. this is an example of the false alarm at first, magnitude 2.5 event occurred, and 15 seconds after, the, uh, after that, magnitude 3.3 .3 event occurred. The maximum seismic intensity was two in both cases. EW couldn't separate those two events, so calculated hypocenter was not stable, but EW accepted one of those hypocenter parameters, and we issued EW warning as magnitude 5.9 event with the maximum seismic intensity five lower to the orange region. Probably we can easily separate those two events after uh, seeing seismic intensity distribution, but there are some difficulties in the real-time analysis. This is second problem. We mainly had two issues from the 2011 M9 event and the aftershocks. First one was that uh, we had to overcome the uh, underestimate of seismic intensity caused by the underestimation of magnitude and the extent of the source region in the case of large quakes. Second one was uh, we had to properly separate uh, event that occurred simultaneously. To overcome those problems, we are developing new methods. First one is IPF method. 
which is named for uh, integrated particle filter method. That means integrated hypocenter determination method using the uh, particle filter. The method improves the conven uh, conventional method based on hypocenter parameter. Second one is PRAM method, which is named for propagation of local undamped motion method, that is simplified version of Hoshiba-san, using the observed real-time seismic intensities. Again, we usually calculate the seismic intensity using 60 second waveforms and forward and inverse Fourier transforms. Kunugi-san in NYED developed the method to calculate the intensity every second in real-time manner using an approximate filter in time domain of a recurrence formula. Moreover, we had a plan to combine improved conventional method, including IPF method and PRAM method. We call it hybrid method. This shows the outline of the IPF method. When we determine the hypocenter parameter, the conventional approach uses some uh, kind of uh, some kinds of data separately. Typically, we use only arrival time to determine hypocenter parameter. However, the IP, I, IPF method uses some kind of data that the arrival time amplitude integrally. It is the same in the case of grouping data. Moreover, the IPF method uses a particle filter to make a grid search efficiently. Furthermore, we confirm that the IPF method could avoid 21 false alarm from March to April 2011, which were all false alarms in this period. This shows the likelihood function, which is a core part of the particle filter. The likelihood function integrates those elements. Oh, those elements. We expect, uh, express the weight of each element by the standard deviation. We determine the function types and the parameters by the trial and error. This figure shows the conceptual diagram of the PRAM method and the hybrid method. The PRAM method is the upper part and the conventional method is the lower part. For example, we can particle, uh, predict the intensity of the target station by selecting the maximum intensity within 30 kilometers. The 30 kilometer means that the strong intensity will propagate to all direction and 10 second read time in the case of S wave s wave velocity three kilometers per second. On the other hand, conventional method use, uh, uses hypocenter parameters. But if the uh, parameter is unreliable, for example, in the case where the maximum amplitude as the nearest three station to the uh, focus cannot explain the parameters, we don't use the conventional method. For example, the blue one Blue star is reliable, and the black one is unreliable. We predict the intensity only when the calculated hip center parameters are reliable. Finally, we choose larger value as expected intensity for each station. Both methods, method has pros and cons. In the case of conventional method, we can have longer read time because we can calculate magnitude assuming P wave. Moreover, we can get hypocenter parameter and use it tsunami forecast. However, we have some possibility of missing insurance of the EEW. In the case of the PRAM method, we have no risk of missing insurance of the EEW and can use the method for mega quakes. But we cannot have a hypocenter parameter and can have shorter lead time. Then hybrid method can cherry pick only both plus. We shouldn't seriously consider the case where we can't determine the hypocenter. We, can't, uh, we can accept the case 
where the auto processing can, cannot determine the uh, accurate percent. This figure shows the new contents of EW, that is EW for long period ground motion. I'll make a presentation about this topic in the next session. And it is summary, I showed the performance of and the important lessons of the 2011 M9 event and the aftershocks. Moreover, I talked future plan to improve the system. That's all, thank you for your attention. So um, first, I'd, I'd like to congratulate JMA on, on the great success. It's a, it's a great inspiration to the rest of us. Uh, any, we have time for a question or two about, uh, about the JMA system. Anyone have? Could you? Could you talk a little? The registered users, no. The registered users versus the public users. Uh, You're fine. Right. We have two. Uh, we have two types of jamming W and uh, forecast and warning. The difference is uh, in. Uh, when we estimate the um, uh, seismic intensity larger than five lower, maximum seismic uh, intensity is five lower, we issued warning. And warning is here. And we issued forecast for registered users. When uh, we, we expect maximum seismic intensity is larger than three, or magnitude uh, 3.5, larger than 3.5, okay? So, so how many registered users are they, and who are registered users? I mean, now there are a lot of registered users because they are free system. Uh, yeah. So I don't know the. Anybody register? Uh, Can anybody who? register, or is it that is that just technical users, or is it just people who pay versus people who get it for free? Yeah. Some people uh, get. Uh, uh, can be a registered user for free now. But do you, must you be a company to be a registered user, or could I be a registered user? <laughs> well, we will talk about this uh, afterwards. So we, we have to we have to move on. So thank you very much. Um,